Rich, thank you very much for uh, studying my bio and, and knowing it. <laughs> I see that as a sign of respect that somebody took the time to read my biography a little bit and understand some of the trails that I've been on. So it's truly a, an extension of gratitude and thanking you for, for knowing a little bit about, about who I am and some of the trails that I've been on over the years. I'm honored to have the opportunity to be here today and to, to bring out my Eagle fan to talk a little bit about treaties with you, treaty understandings and what is our roles and responsibilities as, as we are all treaty people living in this time and in this space. My name is uh, Derek Niepenak, and uh, it is correct, I'm uh, the Grand Chief of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. I'm in my second term, in my fifth year, uh, in this role and responsibility. Previously, the Chief of the Pine Creek First Nation, in my, in my language we would call it the Minigozibi Anishinaabe, and that's uh, the people um, near, near the Pine River, near the Pine Creek, and our community, you know, geographically located on the west shores of Lake Winnipegosis, about uh, 100 kilometers north of Dauphin, about 80 kilometers east of, uh, of Swan River. So some of you may know that neighborhood a little bit. You may know that it has a rich history of, uh, of great fishing in the past. It's also got uh, a lot of large big game in the territory that we would have lived on for, for many generations. The, uh, the way we operate today within our political spaces is uh, not entirely reflective of the treaty arrangements that we, that we once made uh, historically. It's a, it's a frustrated expression of politics. And oftentimes, you know, when I find myself in the public space speaking about treaty, I'm looked at as, as, as someone who is complaining or frustrated with the way things have gone. And, and I think that sentiment is broadly shared because the realization of treaty has yet to happen within this shared space that we now call Canada. You know, many of you may know that over history, going back into the 1800s, there's uh, this phenomenon called the numbered treaties, where the expansion of settler interests, the expansion of Canadian interests beyond the Great Lakes came into this Northern Plains territory. The first of the numbered treaties, Treaty Number 1, was originally negotiated at the Northwest Angle with the Anishinaabe people around what's now Lake of the Woods. That treaty didn't happen. It wasn't, uh, the terms and conditions that were brought forward, they didn't meet the standard of the Anishinaabe people near the Lake of the Woods. The negotiation then carried on into what became known as the Stone Fort Treaty, just north of here at Lower Fort Gary. That's where Treaty 1 was signed. From there, each year, the treaty commissioners would go out and the number of treaties were eventually signed and agreed to. Our people had agreed to certain concessions within those arrangements that we would open up the land for, for settlement, for agricultural development, to share space and to, and to share the prosperity and the peace of the land. That was a, also a fundamental piece of the, of the treaties that we agreed to that a lot of people aren't aware of. We agreed to live in, in peaceful coexistence when those treaties were signed. From there, our people began selecting parcels of land throughout our, throughout our ancestral lands. Some of our communities were able to choose strategically where these, where these parcels of land would be. We call it Ishkonagan, the land that is left outside of the treaty agreement. These lands were supposed to be places where our sovereignty and our connection to the land would remain intact, where our languages would be strong, where our children would be brought into the world and they would know who they were, where they came from, they would know the ancestry and, the, and, 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 and they would know our stories going back many many generations into the, uh, into the millennia. That's what the Ishkonagan was supposed to be, what is now called the reserve. <clears throat> Somewhere along the way, somebody decided that we, we should be better governed by a consolidation of all of the laws under Canada's constitution that dealt with Indians or lands reserved for Indians. And that became, that consolidated statute became what's called the Indian Act. And unfortunately, the Indian Act has a tendency, and it has had a tendency historically, to remove us from the original agreements that were made under treaty. Because I today am bound by treaty as much as you are bound by treaty. Those original covenants that we signed on to are the foundation upon which Canada's constitution rests. If there is a legitimacy to the land tenure system that exists here, that legitimacy is based on the treaty agreements 
It's not found in the provincial laws or the constitution. It's found in those original founding agreements that we made. So as you inherit, you know, those parcels of land from your ancestors, and as that fee simple transfers into your name sometime in your life or, the, or, the, or, or, your, or your families, that is reflective of those original commitments that were made in treaty. So your prosperity that you enjoy here in your opportunity to learn, your opportunity to live in a safe environment, your opportunity to bring children into the world in a safe way that you can raise, is based on the treaty agreements that were made. And it is fundamental. It is fundamental to our human experience here. And I think that each and every time I get an opportunity to share that with students, I'll always take it. Because oftentimes I believe the, the public education that you may have learned may not be reflective of the treaty relationship that you are bound by and that I am bound by. I've seen that time and time again, even within my own lifetime and experience. I have a, an elder, a very old man now, who always shares these stories with me about his youth and his time in residential school. And he said, you know, all of us young kids, when we were kids, we were all speaking our Anishinaabeg language and learning English. And each week they had a movie night. One, one night a week they'd be able to sit down and they'd be able to watch a John Wayne movie. <laughs> and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't you know it, they'd be sitting watching John Wayne and everyone would cheer when the cavalry would come riding over the hill and killing all the Indians in the John Wayne movies. All of our Anishinaabe children would cheer for that. You know, so we reflect upon this, and, and he laughs about it now. You know, he laughs about it because he recognizes the tragedy in that story. You know, and he's gone through the steps that he's needed to in order to heal himself, to be effective and to be a role model for people like me who could also become angry when I reflect upon what happened in terms of our education. Because you see, there is a treaty right to education that's included in our treaty agreements. Our ancestors, when they sat down and they thought about what these treaties would look like, they projected their thoughts into the future. We have visionary leadership and they thought about what would the treaty right to education mean. They thought about a day when we would understand Western thinking and Western thinking would understand our own ways of thinking. A reconciliation and an integration of the powerful ways of thought that we each share. But that hasn't happened. Instead, these residential school systems were created. The Indian Act was used to create laws that meant that if a parent didn't want their child to go to residential school, that they, the RCMP would come in and they would arrest that parent and then they would put that, children in the res that child in the residential school anyway. That's not what we agreed to and that's not what we signed up for. And we know the legacy that that's created, the trauma, the, the dysfunction that many of us suffer from within our families. We're living in that legacy now and we're living in what I believe is the start of the identification of the truths that we need to accept and to begin to heal from. Because the truth, as was presented to you, and presented to myself, and presented to my elder during the John Wayne movies, is not the truth. It's not the truth. The truth is something much more harsh, and the reality is something much more harsh. And there's people that were hurt and damaged along the way. And there's been a perpetuation of that misinformation, even in popular media today. You know, my mind is somewhat caught up in what's happening today because there's an election happening. You know, today everybody gets an opportunity to go out and cast a ballot. And I'm going to do that too. I'm going to do that even though there's criticism against my choice to cast a ballot in today's election. I've been to all the different meetings that have happened over the last number of years since I've been a chief first at home and now as the Grand Chief. I've been to the meetings with the Prime Minister, the various ministers that I've worked with over the years. And I do believe that we need, it. we need to make a change in our, in our level of participation in these processes. Until the 1960s, our people weren't even allowed to vote in federal elections. In 1961, there was a change to the Citizenship Act here in Canada that allowed for Indigenous people to actually go out and vote. So there's people who are alive in this room today, my family members, 
you know, who lived their younger years, not even, allo not even allowed to participate in the selection of who would be representing us over in Ottawa. That created problems. And that's created some anger and resistance to actually participating in this type of federal election forum. I recognize what happened in the past. I recognize the limitations. But I also have to work with the tools that we have today, the tools to bring about change that are available to me. Because you see, I'm the practical Anishinaabe person. I'm going to work with the tools that are available, as imperfect as they may be to, to my participation. I'm going to pick up those tools and I'm going to cast a ballot because that's what I can do. That's my responsibility. And many of us from our Anishinaabe communities, our Cree communities, have relatives you know, who wore the colors of the Canadian Army, who went to war to protect a space where we could be empowered, where we could have a public dialogue like the one we're having today, where we could be strong and we could say what we mean and feel how we need to feel without being fearful that someone is going to shoot us down the minute we walk out the door. Because there are places like that today. There have been places like that throughout history where you could not have an open and public dialogue about the things that are closest to your heart. Those places are out there still. I've been to some of them. I've been to the World Forum on Human Rights in Northern Africa where people have to live in exile in Europe in order to come to a World Forum to talk about what's happening in their country. Because if they spoke like that at the World Forum and then went home to their country of origin, they would be terrorized and, 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 and killed for what they said. So I reflect upon that experience and learning that as I came home. And I thought about the, the great sacrifices that men and women have made for generations to make sure that we have a Canadian space here where we can talk about the difficult issues without fear for our lives. And if we're creating spaces like that, and if people have sacrificed their own lives to create spaces like that, do we not owe it to honor that? Not just on Remembrance Day, or Aboriginal Veterans Day, but each and every day, and particularly on a day when we can go and cast a ballot for who we want to represent us over in Ottawa. That's what I believe. Is it my sovereignty to participate in a federalist system? No, it's not. My sovereignty comes from the, from the protocols and the ceremonies of my, of my community, of my family, of the Anishinaabe nation of people that I'm, that I'm part of. That's where my sovereignty comes from. But I will cast a ballot because I will work with the practical tools of governance that we have available today. That's something that I will do. And that's my treaty responsibility my treaty obligation, my treaty right in governance today. So I ask all of you, if you do have the ability to go and vote today, honor your ancestors and go and cast a ballot for what you believe in. That's what I believe it is to be in a treaty way, to live in the treaty space that we've created here. <clears throat> now when it comes to treaties, once again, I'm going to talk a little bit about land very briefly. We've got a couple of minutes to do that. I know that um, when we signed on to treaty and we agreed to Ashkonagan lands, lands that left outside of treaty, there was a certain number that was chosen per family of five that would be set aside. When people moved into these reserves, there was land left over that wasn't within the full allocations that were set aside. Over generations, those lands became more of a, more of a hot topic because all of the land here is occupied now. But we were left with what's called treaty land entitlements. Entitlements to, to, to lands that were set aside at the time of treaty that were never realized. And one of the very challenging discussions we're having today is about Kapyong Barracks. And that's federal reserve, federal crown lands that are surplus, which means that the crown does no longer need them. And what we did in our treaty territories was we stepped up and we said, hey, we still have treaty land entitlements that are owed through obligation to treaty to our people from the 1870s. We want that parcel of land recognized and, and turned into treaty land. <clears throat> that is a very difficult discussion because of the great divide that's been created over the application of policies, both at the provincial and federal systems, that keep us separated and apart. People are fearful of what it might mean to have a reserve here 
in this neighborhood around Cap Young Barracks. People are uncertain as to what Indigenous people are going to do with that land. But I can assure you that we are progressive people. We are progressive people that are carving out a space in this modern day economy, carving out a space where we can become relevant and we can enjoy the prosperity that everyone else enjoys as well. I saw a sign one time recently in the last few years that represented some of that fear that's out there. Don't let the Indians put a reserve in the city. They're gonna, there's gonna be starving dogs running around in burned out cars. <laughs> that's representative of some of that fear that's out there. But I assure you, we're, we're not that way. We are people who will come with our hands extended once again in treaty to make sure that these lands are developed in a way that everyone can respect them and everyone can feel proud of what we've done as a city, as, as, as the people of this area. I can assure you that that's what will, will become of this. So as you go and these discussions continue to happen, and as a deal is made with our Treaty One communities about what Cap Young is all about and how the process is going to unfold, rest assured that there is opportunity for participation from every single member of society towards the future prosperity of that site. You can rest assured knowing that because that's the Treaty Way. So I was asked to speak for approximately 20 minutes and leave some floor time for, for question and answer. I know that everybody probably has a very busy schedule because you're expected to do everything you do on a Monday plus go and vote. So, <laughs> with that said, I want to thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to be here today. I've been in uh, very intense treaty meetings for the last three days at our national treaty meeting in Regina, which is Treaty 4 territory, with all of our elders from here all the way to the foot of the mountains and then back again. So the treaties are very fresh, they're very strong right now in my mind, in the discussions we've had, the ceremonies that we've had, you know, so to be able to share some of these with you today has been a, a good opportunity for me and a humbling experience because I do believe that we're growing together and this truth and reconciliation process will continue in a good way. Miigwech. Um, I know that language does shape reality and shape um, kind of how we conceptualize things. Um, what is your opinion? Like, what, what is the change that happens when churches, when institutions start to name the treaty territory that they are on? I think it's a, a, an expression of respect when we start to identify the land that, w that we're on. Um, I also believe it would be an expression of respect when we start to identify that a lot of the names of the, of the provinces and the cities and the towns, they're actually indigenous names and indigenous words that a lot of people don't even, don't even know. Um, I think that's important, but it's also very important to be wary of, of, of territorialism that can, I think, spring up oftentimes when we talk about, well, these are Treaty 1 lands, or these are Treaty 2 lands, or these are Treaty 3. We live in a shared space. We don't live in bubbles. We live in shared spaces. And I think that at one time we knew that, you know, because Anishinaabe could travel into, into the Plains Cree territory. We could exchange goods and gifts and protocols. And we could, we could occupy that space as Anishinaabe living in Cree territory without, without any fear. Or we could go visit the Lakota people and we could, we could visit with them do the same thing, exchanging protocol. And in that way, we break down those barriers of territorialism. So I think it's an important expression of respect to identify where you're at on the ground, but don't allow it to, to galvanize into this sense of territorialism because we live in a shared space. Uh, thank you again for your visit. One of the questions I have as a member of Pegwis First Nation and a Treaty One member, how can I get involved in the developments that are gonna be happening at Kapiong Barracks? I think one of the ways that uh, we, we have seen things happening in the last number of years is that we're recognizing that accountability has to go both ways. You know, and within this colonial structure that, that has been created under the Indian Act, the reserve system, the chief and council system, is that our role in leadership and our accountability has always gone back to the federal government in terms of reporting, uh, how spending is being done and how the money is moving. But what that's done is that oftentimes it's created a bit of a divide between our chief and council and their responsibilities back to the community. 
And uh, it goes both ways. The community members have a responsibility to become more involved, to ask questions of their leadership, to go to the band meetings, bring Bannock to the band meetings, and tea, maybe soup sometimes, <laughs> and, 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 and go there and sit and, and break bread and find out what your chief and council are up to and ask the difficult questions. I've been in band meetings at times in different communities and even in my own community where, where people felt disempowered in the process and they did not want to speak. We've got to figure out ways of breaking down that, that, uh, those barriers and I think that bringing bannock and soup is a good way to do it. <laughs> I'm just wondering about uh, those outside and within society that, that uh, they, they see no relevance of that even though they are living here and how do we engage with them and how do we uh, begin to uh, uh, maybe help them get a clear understanding of the realities of Treaty 1 and what that implies uh, living here? It's a, that's a very good question because, you know, I, I believe that our society and being a, a market-driven capitalist type of experience is oftentimes a, a secular experience. And I, I know that when we come together in our treaty gatherings, we are, we are praying and uh, um, we pray in a certain way, but there's other people within, our, within our, our treaty movement who pray in other ways. They pray with Bibles, we pray with pipes, we go to our ceremonies, and uh, we are prayerful people in those, in, in those circles. I do believe that uh, recognizing responsibility to the treaty relationship cannot be just purely a secular event of, in someone's life. It has to, it has to I think, reach the spirit. It has to go beyond the intellect and the mindful things we do and actually go to the heart of people. That's where the, where, where the, where the spirit is. And I think that we need to, to do that in, a, in our spiritual way. And, and we, accept, uh, you know, we accept that people pray in different ways. We don't exclude anybody because they pray in, in, you know, in this way or that. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's something that we, we don't do. But we also recognize that uh, there is a need to reach for a higher power in overcoming some of these challenges because if we just stay embroiled in the day-to-day, -day, uh, we won't see the forest through the trees and uh, we will continue to, to spin our wheels here. So I do believe being prayerful is a, is a, is a big piece of all of this. Um, my experience in a lot of these conversations, especially when engaging predominantly white um, circles, is the conversation gets framed as, so what do we do about the the Indian problem, and instead of looking at what is the settler problem that's created this. And so a question, working within a, a white institution, I guess what I wrestle with is what are the hopes and dreams that indigenous peoples have for the roles and responsibilities of settler institutions? What kinds of engagements would you like us to boldly step into when you're sitting back and dreaming about it, I long for a university to engage X, Y, Z or something. During the, the life of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there was a series of different events that happened in different cities over, over that four-year four time frame. And, and one of the things that really stuck with me was that in the last event that was held in Edmonton, there was um, a, a small group of non-indigenous people who walked to the event. And that to me was um, a moment. It represented, I believe, a watershed moment to allow us as indigenous people to recognize that, that non-indigenous people recognize our challenges. You know, and, and that, that to me um, is, is where a lot of the, the, the greatest strides can be made is in demonstration of recognition. Because when we go to government, like for example, when we go to government spaces, sometimes in Ottawa, we're treated as if we don't exist. And that, that is hurtful, it's painful. Because in the treaty relationship, we're all related. And um, when, I, when I saw these, 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 these men walking to the, to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission event in Edmonton, I felt good, I felt some hope because I, I saw that there was non-Indigenous people who recognized the pain, the trauma, the legacy of, of what we've been through and they're, they're offering 
you know, their prayers in a good way to help us through. And since then, I've looked for that in society. I've gone to the, for example, the Tar Sands Healing Walk in Fort McMurray, where we walk 14 kilometers around the Suncor site where they're doing the, um, the tar sands extraction. And there was a lot of non-Indigenous people that, that made that walk. And they participated each and every day in our pipe ceremony. And that reaffirmed to me the willingness to merge and to come together in this spiritual reconciliation that has to be part of this healing process. So your demonstration to us as Indigenous people, of your commitment to the reconciliation process, it speaks volumes to us. And it's done through actions, not through colorful statements that are made in the media, but it's done by the actions on the ground. When we walk and you're walking with us, that's a powerful, powerful thing.